Hi, my name is Sharon Sarner. It is January the 14th, 2014. I'm working with the Jewish Historical Society of Fairfield County, and we are interviewing Leslie Myers for the Veterans Historical Project. Hello, Les. Good morning. It's so nice of you to agree to be interviewed for the Veterans History Project. It's my pleasure. And we, we have a few questions we need to ask you. Shoot. Sure. Okay. The first one is, tell us briefly about your family. Uh, my parents were born in Russia, came to this country, each of them at two years old. And uh, uh, I have two, had two brothers, one older and one younger. Both were in the service and uh, had quite a, uh, both had quite a, rec a record, something that I didn't have the opportunity to have. Where and when were you born? I was born in Bridgeport, Connecticut, August 20th, 1921. What was your parents' occupation? My father had a, uh, uh, when he got married, he was a bank teller, and his brother had a store, was moving to Norwa to uh, Stanford. He had a store in Bridgeport and sold it to my father, and he was uh, in the retail until he uh, retired. And uh, we went from the store in Bridgeport to a store in Stanford, and that's what brought us to Stanford. And you said you had one older and one younger brother, correct? Right. And they both served in the military as yes, well? Yes, they did. Okay. How did you happen to serve in the military? Uh, the war came on and, uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, 1941, a week before Pearl Harbor, uh, Sylvia and I announced our engagement. And uh, then after Pearl Harbor, I just waited uh, until I was 21 because otherwise I would need my mother's permission to join. And I joined the Air Force uh, as a uh, cadet. What was your training like? The training was uh, <laughs> flight training. I had all the pre-flight, all the basics at first, and then went into a uh, uh, flight, and uh, it was uh, it was not in flight where that uh, that I was hurt. It was on the ground in physical training, and uh, it, it, this hurt me more than the results of the accident. What hurt me more was the fact that I would not be able to complete my training and be in the Air Force for the reason I enlisted. How far into your training did your injury occur? I had uh, uh, about 40-some-odd uh, hours of uh, free flight, mm -hmm. and uh, I was doing very well. And. Uh, the, It was quite an experience. I was, what happened was, I was, uh, uh, we were doing physical training. We flew one week, we would fly in the morning, and, the, and then the following week, we would fly in the afternoon. In the morning, we'd do our, our PT, or we'd do it in the afternoon if we were flying in the morning. And uh, this was in an, an afternoon where, uh, uh, I, I didn't want to participate in any of the games at that time. I was uh, uh, jogging around the field, uh, the athletic field. There was basketball on one court on the side and football. They were playing touch football in the, uh, on the field. And uh, uh, I don't know, I never saw it coming, but uh, someone, I don't know if they threw the ball or kicked the ball. But uh, as I'm jogging, uh, the ball, was, uh, I didn't know it was coming from behind me, and this man was going after the, the ball jumped up. He was about three inches taller than me, and he was running. He leaped over me, came down on me, 
did not catch the ball. And when I fell, I came down on my right arm and uh, had a, a compound fracture. And of course there was a dirt, which at one time was a, a, a pasture. So uh, it was very dangerous. Uh, they carried me to the office. It was a one-room office on this field. It was in uh, Americas, Georgia. It was field was Souther Field, S-O-U-T-A. You've heard of it? <laughs> and uh, uh, it, actually, it, it was, it has a history. It was the first bombing training, the bomber training field in World War I. And uh, so the facilities were strictly for uh, primary flight training. And uh, uh, they carried me to that one office and waited for an ambulance to come and brought me to Turner Field in Albany, Georgia. And uh, I was there for about, uh, I would say, close to two weeks. Uh, when I got there, of course, the first thing I told the, the air, uh, the uh, flight surgeon, that uh, I'm allergic to the tetanus antitoxin. And uh, uh, when I was 12 years old, it almost killed me. And when I uh, uh, and when I told the doctor, he said, well, we would automatically give you a skin test to see how much you can take. And the antitoxin was not enough. It, it did paralyze me, which I knew would happen because that's what happened with the first time when I was 12. Uh, that lasted about uh, four or five days of the East. eased. And, uh, they transferred me to Lawson General Hospital in Atlanta, Georgia, where they did everything they could to save my life, knowing that they're not going to be able to save my arm. And uh, uh, it worked, and I'm here, and I've had a, uh, uh, I've, it, life has been good. I've had my ups and downs, but uh, mostly ups, and uh, that's a lot for a 21-year-old to take, right? You were 21 when this happened, correct? Yeah, I was 21, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, I got married when I was 22. Did you face any Jewish discrimination or see any? Uh, we had, there were several Jewish boys in our organ, in our uh, squadron, and uh, some, uh, one of them, uh, I have met since the war and was in contact with him until he moved to Oregon. And uh, uh, others, the Gentile boys, uh, I kept in contact with uh, about four or five of them. And uh, uh, but as far as anti-Semitism, I saw none. Now, it was, in fact, we had for Passover, in Montgomery, Alabama, we had a Seder at the uh, Standard Country Club, and there must have been seven or eight hundred men at this Seder, and on the following Sunday, it appeared in the southern edition of the Sunday, the Daily uh, Sunday News, New York Sunday News, the centerfold of the a picture of the, the room, and you can, and I can pick, I was on the balcony, there were about 20 tables on the, on the balcony, and I was on, one, I could tell you where that table was, and I could picture me on sitting there with a Stanford boy who uh, was not, uh, he was in the Air Force, but was not in flight training, uh, sitting opposite me. I met him when we got off the uh, trucks that brought us to the uh, country club.
Now, who led the Seder? Was it led by other soldiers or in trainees? It or had the rabbi? There was a rabbi, there were more than one rabbi there, yes. That's and wonderful. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, cadets all had a choice of going to the Seder or, go, or going to a home in Montgomery. And uh, I, I took the, uh, the Seder at the country club. Sounds like everybody else did. The, the, uh, that I might meet some other fellows. I did meet one from Stanford. That's nice. Yeah. How did you um, adjust to the military life for the time you were Very there? Very easily. Very easily. We, we, yeah, the first month was uh, mostly in doing tests, testing to see whether you're really fit for the pilot training, mm -hmm. eye exams, uh, uh, all kinds of uh, testing, and uh, uh, I passed, I made it, I qualified for the pilot training, and uh, training uh, at, at out of the pre-flight training, we had uh, uh, physical training. We learned uh, Morse code, and uh, which as, <laughs> as I had, as a, that was quite something because I had a music background, and it came to me very easily. It came to me in one day. And they said, "When you learn the, when you learn to do it, you can leave the program." So on the first day, that I, I was getting up to walk out because I had already passed the test. And they said, no, you've got to stay at least three days. <laughs> so uh, uh, it came in handy because there was a Jewish boy in one of, we lived seven men in a room. There were uh, uh, row, like row houses with seven uh, men, seven beds in each room with the bath and uh, it was very comfortable and uh, in one of the rooms there was uh, Abe, his name was Abraham Levin and he just could not get the, 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 the code, he couldn't get the, the difference between a beep and, a, <laughs> and, uh, and I was able to uh, give them the sounds and I taught him that way, and he passed. So, uh, That's a lovely story. So you were his tutor. I was his tutor. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah. In fact, they, the, it was the other other fellow, the one that lives in Oregon now, who called me to see if we can help Abe. <laughs> yeah. his, his name was uh, uh, let's see, Irwin. I'm trying to think of the last name. I'm drawing a, a okay. blank, but uh, he had a shoe store in New Canaan. Oh, really? His uh, his cousin was his name was Irwin. His cousin name was Irving. They were both named after the same <laughs> person. That's funny. Lebo. Lebo. Yeah, in the shoe store, the women's shoe store in New Canaan, and. Uh, uh, they were, they were great guys, and, and no one brought up the uh, Judaism at any time. In fact, my best friend in, in, uh, was not Jewish. The one closest, he was like a brother. His name was Tony Palermo from Danbury. He was a fifth grade st teacher in Western Connecticut. And, uh, uh, and he said, uh, the first thing he said when he told, when I, I told him that I'm going to the Seder, he said, bring me back some wine. <laughs> Naturally. That's great. That is great. Yeah. So what was the food like in general? What was the food like? Not the Seder, but the food in the military. The food was, uh, uh, it was, I could say it was substantial. <laughs> At America's Georgia, the food was exceptional because we had a civilian kitchen. This, before my class came to this uh, field, the uh, previous class were 
uh, English pilots hmm. from the, uh, uh, the British Army Air Force, and uh, they were getting their primary training there. And uh, in fact, they, they left, they had all the flying suits and everything, and it was stuff. they still had the British flag up on the wall. Uh, didn't last long. <laughs> what was the social life like? Sounds very social, congenial. Social life was good. Uh, uh, for, for some reason, uh, I, had, I had a group uh, with Tony and uh, there was a uh, fellow, Jack Pearson, uh, that's another story. Uh, he was a handsome fellow who worked for the Department of Agriculture in Florida mm -hmm. as a civilian. And uh, a, a Stanford, another Stanford boy, uh, Konashek. And uh, there were two others, and when at whatever time we went, had, could leave the post, we, uh, uh, we just got together, and uh, and we had some great, great fun. I was able to go shopping to buy a gift for my father for Father's Day, and uh, in, in that little town there was a Jewish merchant. Really? We had there was a Walgreens drugstore, and we went to uh, we went swimming at a pond, in the outskirts, and came back into town, and uh, we went to uh, to get uh, milkshakes. So I told <laughs> I told the young boy who was probably 13 years old behind the counter. I said, "What are you doing back there?" He says, "I work here." I said, but you're only 13. He says, you mean you have grown people making sodas? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, let's see, uh, I went from, uh, from uh, Turner Field to Atlanta, Georgia, to, uh, I think I said, to Los Angeles. I spent, I was there until October. As far as uh, uh, anti-Semitism, there was no such thing. This, I was in an officer's ward and was considered an officer and uh, got all the privileges. And when I was able to get out of bed, I went to have my meals in the officer's mess. And uh, the food there was, of course, exceptional. <laughs> Were any of your friends allowed to see you when you were in the hospital? Were any of them able to come visit you? Yes, visiting hours were almost all day. There were no limits, and I could leave if you're able. Once you're able to get out, to to get out, get dressed, get into uniform, the uh, uh, you can go into town on pass every day as long as you're, and you can stay out overnight as long as you're there for inspection on Monday morning. And uh, I don't know how these fellows latched on to me, but one was, uh, one was a, uh, a, a B-47 pilot who was uh, injured when the, plane, the nose wheel went down on the plane at the, at the end of the runway. There was a some kind of a barrier and he smashed into it. And uh, uh, the man in the bed next to me, his name was Daniker. He was a major. And I didn't have my uniforms. They never sent them to me. So he gave me his uniform. He couldn't get out of bed and he had no intention to because he had a situation, they were freezing his knee because he had a, a, a damaged nerve in, in, the, in the knee. And uh, he, would, he knew that he would have a limp for the rest of his life. But uh, the, the fellows on the, on the ward, uh, we had at all ages, the, <laughs> the funniest one was the oldest one who was head of the uh, Southeast Air Force uh, 
police, military police. He was a major also, uh, and uh, his name was Fishback. And he never called for a nurse. He, when he wanted a nurse, he would holler for Angel of Mercy. <laughs> I can tell you day by day, but because I have a, 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 a complete uh, recall. So uh, I don't want to take up too much time on this, but the, there was one uh, lieutenant who was, uh, had a broken leg and was being, it was in rehab now, uh, but he was on crutches. He was a southerner, and uh, he was the one who asked me to go to, to uh, uh, dinner with him at the officers' club first, because I wasn't getting out of bed yet. So I said, all right, as soon as I get a uniform, I'll be able to go. He says, you can go in your robe, they, they don't mind. So I did, I, I, I had my robe, I got dressed. This is quite an experience. We, you get your tray, you have somebody carries a tray for you. They brought us to the first table and I sat down. He sat down opposite me. And along comes the captain, was a doctor, and he was black. And this lieutenant gets up from his seat and he says, let's go and sit by the window. And I said, no, thanks. I said, I'm perfectly comfortable right here. And he got up and he left. And who came in? The captain was sitting alongside him. Mm -hmm. And who, I have an empty seat alongside me. In walks General Starr. And he sits down. And uh, we had a uh, great conversation with our meal and he got up behind us was a big buffet that had a bowl with it had to be this big piled with fruit and he goes over and he gets a piece of fruit for captain for me and for himself and uh, when i went back to the uh, to the ward uh, all the fellows with the exception of the one, uh, I, call, uh, I call him a redneck, uh, well, with the exception of him, they all applauded when I walked in. I said, hey, I had dinner, I had dinner with the general. <laughs> I said, it was very nice. I said, he was, it was good company. And, uh, it made quite a hit. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm yeah. sure. That's, that's a wonderful story. How did you stay in touch with your family and friends? I kept writing. Right. Yeah, I wrote, I wrote often. How often did your fiance write to you? You were engaged at the time, correct? Yes. How, did she write you a lot? Oh, yeah. 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 And uh, her stepmother sent me a box of these Hungarian pastries that she made that were, I think I had two out of the box, the rest of the guys all went through them. <laughs> but that's what they're for. After you healed and uh, you were discharged, um, what did you do when you returned home? I came home, they told me to, to, to well, take it easy for a while, and, but I couldn't. Uh, when I was uh, when I left home, I weighed 154 or 155 pounds, and uh, I had a, a 30 a, a 34 inch waistline. And how tall were you? Six feet. And after two months, I gained 11 pounds. And my waistline was down to 32 inches. So I was like this. It, I was in excellent condition or I would not have survived. 
How were your spirits? How did you keep your spirits up during this time? Uh, I had one man, a lieutenant, he was from Long Island, and uh, he was Italian, I'm trying to think of his name, it'll come to me. And he, uh, uh, when I came back for, after they told me they're going to do the amputation, he saw the way I, I looked. And uh, he, uh, he came over and he sat down. And uh, I, I think we were both just about the same age. But he, uh, he got his commission in college with the ROTC. And uh, I don't know what his job, his job was, what kind of an outfit he was attached to, but he said, you know, you got your whole life ahead of you. And he gave me a lecture, and the minute he walked away, I made a 180 degree turn. Yeah, from that one man. I bless him. That's wonderful. Yeah. So when you got back to Stanford, uh, what did you do? When uh, we, we got, I got back to Stanford, it was uh, October the 14th, 1943, and uh, uh, called Sylvia, and she, she and her father came to Stanford to see me. Then I went there to Bridgeport, and we made plans to get married. We got married on Thanksgiving Day, 1943. And my enlistment date, I don't think I told you, was uh, September 18th, 1942. And can you tell me something about your discharge, your process of discharge? Uh, discharge, it was a, a, a disappointment. They told me the things that I could do or things that I can't do and uh, whatever. And uh, uh, it wasn't an, until the, uh, I got home that a man who had a shoe store in Stanford, Harry Rosenfeld, Mayfair Shoe Store uh, on Atlantic Street, uh, told me about the Veterans Administration and he got me papers. He said, fill it out and you should do everything through the VA. And since then, I have done everything through the VA, and they have been marvelous. I could find no complaints at any time. Did you, how was your adjustment to civilian life? Came very easily. Well, you got married pretty, um, pretty much immediately, right? Yeah. And then, so then. Yeah, so he was waiting for me. Uh, it was a blessing. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've been very fortunate. We, uh, I had a, uh, before I went into service, I had a, a print shop. I worked originally for a Hudson Paper Company. And uh, uh, I went to printing school in New York. I graduated high school at 16. I, I, went, uh, I was going to go to college. But uh, the only money that we had in the house was money that I had for college. So when my father came home th about 2.30 in the afternoon, and I said, what are you doing home? He said, I just got laid off. And this was in uh, 1938. So uh, uh, instead of going off to uh, college, I went to New York and registered at the uh, New York School of Printing. Got a room, I went to school at night. I got a job at, uh, at a, uh, an ironworks building fire escapes on tenement houses. It was hard work, but it was the $10 a week was able to do it for me, believe it or not. We made do. So what kind of life lessons, you've already shared many of them with us, but are there any others that you, that you learned from your military experience? What was that? Life lessons that you, that you've already shared some things, but are there, are there any other lessons that, through, that have carried with you through life that you learned in the military? Well, uh, it, it, we, had, we lived by the West Point Honor Code. And uh, 
and I, I brought my children up to live by the, the honor code and to tell me to do things right and get respect. You don't, that people don't have to respect you, you earn it. And uh, the honor code, in fact, uh, I was at a, an affair and a, a woman major in the army, uh, I knew she had been a, a West Point graduate, and so I went to her, and when they introduced me to her, I said the first line of the honor code, and I said, uh, sir, or madam, honor is a natural and inherent standard of distinction, and she stopped me, she said, what class were you in? She thought I had gone to West Point, but this is the training that we got at, uh, in, uh, in pre flight And uh, uh, the, uh, the war, I worked for, uh, in a, uh, a department store. When I got home, I didn't want to sit around doing nothing. Uh, it wasn't in me. I couldn't reopen my print shop. I, I bought a print shop when I was 19 years old. Uh, I heard that the sheriff was foreclosing this print shop, and he uh, and I went, I went over. I ran over to find out what would it cost for me to take it over. And he said three hundred dollars. This was in uh, 1940. And I had the $300. I went right out and I got it. I said, wait here. And I took over the print shop. And I was in business when I was 19. It wasn't easy getting a job when I got out, even though it was in the war. But I had uh, one uh, company that turned me down because I wouldn't sign a waiver that if I got hurt, they would not be responsible. And this was at a desk job, not in a, in a factory. Uh, later came, uh, years later, when I was on the President's Committee for the Employment of the Handicap, I, at a luncheon, I brought this up, and we got a discussion after the luncheon about it, and we, we got in touch with congressman and senator, and before you know it, you got a bill through that was passed that when you, uh, uh, when, when you, uh, on your applications, they, they cannot have you sign a waiver in order to get the job. It, it's, it is illegal, and I have the feeling that I had something to do with that. I have a feeling too. Is there anything else you want to mention? Uh, well, about my background? Uh, uh, Tell about the military experience, yeah, anything? After the, uh, after the, 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 uh, the war, my brother came home, and uh, he was wounded twice. He was in the 36th Division. He was recommended for Congressional Medal of Honor they gave him a silver star. And what happened was that he uh, was under fire from a German mortar uh, or a machine gun, I don't remember what it was, but the uh, uh, two men in the yard of this house got hit. One could not make it back by himself. And uh, my brother went out under fire and brought him in. My brother left his radio because the mortar hit the building and, and smashed his radio. It was inoperable. So he left and he went out and there was a wall there and he ran up and down the wall and made it look like there was more than one soldier out there firing and he finally, he finally with a grenade, he put a stop to the shooting that was coming, 
and uh, they were able to leave the the premises. And uh, but when he got, uh, uh, he was recommended first by his captain for a brown star, and the and uh, they, the, the next uh, the higher level to put on the uh, a higher award, and then the top one said should go for a Congressional Medal of Honor, and he uh, uh, it went right to the top. And when it came back, I saw the paper. I don't know what happened to it when I mean, he died, everything went with him. But the paper was written right on it, Silver Star, Medal of Honor rejected. This soldier should not have left his radio. The radio was destroyed. So his captain, who was a Methodist, when he got this paper back and he showed it to him, he said, I hate to show this to you. His name was Sid, but they always called him George. He said, George, I hate to show this to you because it tells you something. And he looks at it and said, man should not have left his radio. He said, this paper tells you that this Jew is not getting a Congressional Medal of Honor. And that's what his captain told him. And uh, it was a, my brother Gene was a paratrooper and then transferred into the uh, Rangers, and he was sent to uh, Italy in the mountains and pulled out of the mountains and sent to Norway and uh, got, the, got rid of the Nazis in Norway, and he got a commendation from King Olaf. Yeah, so uh, they did for me what I couldn't do, both of them. Any other questions? Anything else you want to tell us? Uh, I was telling you about my, uh, my uh, business. When I got out, uh, got out of the printing school, I went out for a job and I couldn't get one because I had no experience. This is before the war, before this your military. This is no. Oh, this is after your military. Before. Before. Okay. Yeah. The uh, I went to a print shop, and I asked the, the owner if he would hire me for two weeks at no pay. I work here for two weeks at no pay. Why? Because every place I go answering an ad, they want someone with experience, which I don't have. I want to get, I be able to say I worked for the Richmond Printing Company. So he said, come on in. It was on a Wednesday. I worked Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. At that time, $10 a week, that was 25 cents an hour was the, was the, uh, uh, the minimum wage. He handed me a $5 bill, which was more than 25 cents an hour. And I, I said, I'll see you on Monday. Monday I came in, he said, don't take your jacket off. I said, uh-oh. I said, what happened? The insurance company complaining that I'm not on your payroll? He said, no. He said, the Hudson Paper Company next door is putting in a printing department. They have no one to run it. There's a, a new pr a press that they're using to print on the boxes, the gift boxes that they sell. And uh, it, it has all, it's all done with type. It has to be typeset for every uh, company that they print. Or, and also setting up the press. While the machine is being set up, the man 
we're setting it up, we'll teach you how to operate the press. And so I went there and I did very well. Yes. Until I bought the, uh, the other print shop. Yeah. I, I guess I have one more question for you. Yeah. Was it, well, it had to be very frustrating when you uh, finished your military service and because of your, your horrible injury, when you came back did you feel limited tremendously in what you could do or did you not see that as an impairment? Not at all. Not at all. In fact, I played one season of base of uh, softball with my old team. We had a reunion, oh, yeah, yeah. and we had uh, we had we played three games. And I played. I used uh, uh, before the war. I played first base, and we were the city champions two yeah. years in a row. And uh, uh, when I came back, they put me out in center field. Yeah. Were you right-handed before? No. Were you really? Yeah. I guess that's the only blessing you can find in this is that I you were think, lefty, right? I think if I had fallen the other way because I'm left-handed, I might have been able to save myself. Oh, it's very possible. I've thought about that mm -hmm. uh, many times, but uh, <laughs> uh, it means nothing now. Right. But uh, I've had my successes, and my daughter said, Dad, she read the book. Uh, unbroken, yeah. Yeah. and it told how many cadets died in training and were injured in training, one of which was me. Mm -hmm. And she said, you know, I hate to say this, Dad, but after reading how many pilots died in World War II, I'm so glad you came home even the way you did. She said that to, to me, to her, that was a blessing. Yeah. So uh, I've been very fortunate. I've had my good times. We made it, and uh, I have three beautiful grandchildren and eight beautiful great grandchildren. I've been retired for 33 years. I retired at 59 and uh, have no problems. I can say something that very few can say. We bought our first house in 1946. It was a two-family house. I bought it with my brother because he needed a place to live when he came home also. He was married, he got married before the war. And uh, we bought the house together. The house cost $8,000. We had, we each paid 35 or $36 a month on a mortgage. And we lived in the house for 12 years. He built a house in another part of town, and, I, and so did we. After 12, 12 years, and since then, Sylvia and I have never paid a penny in interest to anyone for anything, whether it's a car or our second house we built and paid for it as it was being built. So uh, I can say we've had our successes, and uh, we came a long way, and hopefully we have a couple more good years. I think so. I think you're teaching Mahjong. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Thank you so much. My pleasure.